Hello again, it's Margie, and we're going to go on to part two of the prostate BPH cancer lecture. The reason I stopped that lecture abruptly was I was unhappy that the algorithm was cut off at the bottom, and so I tried to pause it, and then it kind of kicked me out, and rather than re um, tape the whole thing again, I said, well, I'll just put it into two parts. So anyway, on to the AU, AUA guidelines as far as treatment options for BPH. Let's take a look at this algorithm. Initial evaluation is going to include your history, your DRE, by focused uh, PE, your urinalysis, and your PSA. And then you're going to do your um, symptom index assessment of the patient and to see if the symptoms bother you them or not. So let's go over to the left over here, mild symptoms, less than seven, and they don't bother the patient at all. You go down here to watch for waiting. All right, follow up in a year, and of course they come back if they have any problems sooner. If it's moderate or severe symptoms on their index and they bother the patient, all right, you can do these optional diagnostic tests or refer to urology here. You can discuss their treatment options. If the patient chooses non-invasive therapy and you're going to discuss all this with them, you can go on to medical therapy, which is something that you can do in the office. If they want one of these optional tests or diagnostic tests or you feel they should have it, then you can go ahead and I would refer them over here to urology because they can do pressure flow, cystoscopies, ultrasounds, and all kinds of uh, further diagnostic tests and either do medical therapy or minimally invasive therapies or surgery. And if they have presence of uh, persistent gross hematuria, bladder stones, recurrent UTIs, renal insufficiency. Uh, earlier I said if I saw a lot of uh, hematuria, I would probably refer to urology anyway for the appropriate therapy. Then uh, it could be bladder cancer. It could be lots of things over here. So anyway, th the point is at this particular point, refer to urology because there's lots of things going on. Digital rectal exam, I think we've gone over this um, many times, and this is the typical position of a male patient when performing that. Infection and malignancy. When men do come in with boarding problems, that's what you're trying to figure out. Do they have an infection, or is it something that's um, more ominous than that? Your urinalysis we discussed, urinary tract, RBCs, WBCs, bacteria, and then malignancy if there's a hematuria, think bladder cancer. One thing I want to add as far as the getting the CBC in the UA, if they come in with a really high fever and they look really ill to you, this is the time when you send them down for a lab draw. When you do get the CBC, I would also order a blood culture. Labs. We talked about urinalysis and men. We always get a urine culture. It's good to get a Chem 7 if you want to assess renal function. And then we can talk a little bit about this PSA test, which I'm sure most of you, of course, are familiar with. But it is for men that are in the watchful waiting um, arena, you are going to... The lab, the PSA, is useful in detecting, staging, and monitoring treatment response and detecting reoccurrence in your male patients. Routine screening is at age 40 for all men. This has been a change because initially it used to be routine screening at age 50 in Caucasian men and in ethnic minorities and especially in the uh, black patient population, we started PSA testing at age 40 due to increased incidence in prostate cancer in African-American males in their 40s. So now it's 40 for all men. To me, it's easier to remember. PSAs are considered normal if the value comes in between 0 and 
four. It's good to know. It's good to get a baseline. And then what happens if they're in this watchful waiting phase? So what are you looking for? What are we waiting for? What are you watching for? Well, if the PSA doubles in fewer than three years, that's a good time to refer to urology, whether or not they're having voiding symptoms or not. And a PS changes by greater than 0.75 in a year. It used to be 0.50 in a year. That's considered significant and that gets the patient a referral to urology. So in other words, at age 45, say, your loved one uh, goes in and gets a PSA within the normal range and it comes back at 2. Very good. We have nothing to worry about. He has no voiding issues, etc. Well, if he gets another PSA in another year and it's 2.75, that's a referral to urology. Even though it's within the normal 0 to 4, it's a change by greater than 0.75 a year. So you would go ahead and refer. Optional diagnostic tests, and if the patient wants to have further testing done, urology can do things such as a urinary flow rate, which measures the volume of urine voided in a five-second measurement. If the flow is reduced, it means obstruction and possible BPH. A post-void residual urine test may be helpful in patients with complex medical histories, if they have a neurological condition or other diseases known to affect bladder function, a PVR may be helpful. If they've failed uh, prior uh, conservative management of BPH therapy, urology may consider a post-void residual urine. And uh, anybody that's desiring these tests, they can talk to urology about it. And then, of course, there's Im imaging. And imaging, they can do an IVP. And it's useful because when the dye is in the urinary tract, they can insert a rectal probe into the rectum and do a sonogram on the prostate. And what this does is a sonogram bounces the sound waves off the prostate and it gives the urologist a real good feel for how big the prostate is, which comes into, um, makes a difference later on when they have to consider what kind of surgical option, if any, they're going to do with this patient. And cystoscopy, sometimes it's useful to gain information on the prostate, though usually we see this type of thing done with gross hematuria when the urologist wants to see what's going on in the bladder. Treatment um, for any patient that has moderate to severe symptoms. We can start out with our medical therapy, which is going to include our alpha blockers, and our 5-alpha uh, reductase inhibitors. Alpha blockers are useful when the prostates are small. And if you have a feel for that, you can go ahead and try them on an alpha blocker. If you've done a DRE and you're pretty good at it, and you think that there's no nodules, we're not dealing with a cancer, and you want to start the patient on it, you can go ahead and I recommend that. Alpha blocker, like I said, are useful in small prostates, and are, they're also useful in those, of course, with hypertension. The 5-alpha reductase inhibitors are indicated in patients with large prostates. Combined therapy can be done with the alpha-1 and the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, but it should only be considered in patients with high risk for progression. Surgery can include TURP, which are your transurethral resection of the prostate, TUIP, which is your transurethral incision of the prostate, and these are going to be tests that are going to be determined by, of course, radiology, um, urology, TUMT, which is transurethral microwave thermotherapy, or TUNA, which is transurethral needle ablation of the prostate. And these are the tests that men often will go for 
to avoid an open reduction um, of the prostate itself. This is uh, an example of a TUMP where the catheter is inserted and it puts off microwave um, like ultrasound, if you will, to ablate here or cut away at the prostate gland, its size, to make it smaller. More on the alpha-1 adrenergic blockers because this is something that we do prescribe in primary care. The theory being that BPH is partly caused by alpha-1 adrenergic mediated um, system which causes contraction of the smooth muscle in the prostate gland and that equals your bladder outlet obstruction. And if we use the alpha um, adrenergic blockers, this relaxes the smooth muscle of the bladder neck and the prostate and it reduces outflow and obstruction. Patients love these medicines. It's considered first line. It will strengthen their urinary stream and reduce post um, void residual urine. Titration of the dose is necessary. Long-term efficacy has not been determined and side effects can be orthostatic hypotension, dizziness, and headache. The 5-alpha reductase inhibitors are more of a hormonal treatment. It produces a state of androgen deprivation. Androgens feed your prostate gland, which makes it grow. 30% of patients over six month period will have a significant reduction in prostate volume by using a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. However, a drawback to this is that it will reduce your PSA levels by 50%, which is good, but it also, you, you lose the utility of monitoring a PSA level for, for cancer screening if the patients are on a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. And the side effects of these are decreasing in, um, decreased libido, ejaculatory dysfunction, and impotence. We've already talked quite a bit about prostate cancer throughout the lecture. Given the epidemiology, it is the most common cancer in men. The incidence does increase with age. 30% of men aged 60 to 69 will develop a prostate cancer, and 70% of men aged 80 to 9 will have a prostate cancer. Greater than 40% of men over 50 have prostate cancer, but they won't die from it. Typically, prostate cancer is a very slow-growing cancer, and usually treatment for it is not necessary. Um, if you biopsied all the prostates in men that have died greater than, say, 75 years old, the statistics are maybe 90 to 95 percent of all of those prostates will show evidence of a prostate cancer. However, it wasn't an aggressive cancer, it didn't metastasize anyway, and the patients did not die of the prostate cancer. They died of other things. So to treat or not to treat is always the question of a man with prostate cancer. Now the difference being in young men with prostate cancer, it's a very aggressive cancer. So any young man, say 40, you start checking for prostate cancer and you feel a nodule and they have it, you refer immediately to urology, of course, as they will be one of the ones that are treated. And actually, this is sort of a little bit of an ethical dilemma because the newest guidelines, we were always as providers going, well, what do you do with a, you know, 89 year old guy that comes in and he wants to have his PSA checked? Well, if you get the PSA checked and you have changes that indicate particular, you know, possibility of prostate cancer, are you going to refer to urology to you know, have a surgery with the high incidence of side effects from surgery, such as impotence and, you know, at this age group, what are the comorbidities of your patient? Um, what's their quality of life already? What are the chances that they're going to die of something else within the next 10 years or so? So it's always kind of an ethical dilemma. And for years, it's been stressed to us to say, yes, 
to these people. That, yeah, we can go ahead and draw a PSA, but if it is high, what is it that you want to do about it? Yeah, so it, it's really partnering up with your patient in this later age group to see, do you really want this test? Because if we get the results, you know, we really need to, do you want to know the results? And we need to discuss the results. So now they're saying in the latest guidelines to draw them um, in elderly patients only if their life expectancy is um, greater than 10 years. So it's a subtle uh, difference in the new guidelines, but it's something that um, you can pick up. Once again, here you go. All right, so signs and symptoms of um, prostate cancer are a hard stony nodule in with the DRE. Most of the time, men will be asymptomatic, so it's really up to you to be doing those prostate checks to pick up that prostate cancer and, if, and to do the PSA at 40 years old and above. And if you feel something abnormal or you're unsure, please refer to urology. You'd rather be, you know, wrong in thinking that there's something there that's not than to blow off something that's really there and you don't get the patient um, to the right level of care that they may, that it may, may need. They may have signs of urinary retention or neurological symptoms. You go ahead and think prostate cancer possibly they could have obstructive voiding symptoms. So this ends the lecture, part one and part two of prostate, BPH, and cancer issues in men. And so I'll go ahead and sign off now. It's Margie Graziano, Nanu Nanu. Have a good day.